Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 140, Pastor J. Dan Gill's The One. Pastor J. Dan Gill is the editor-in-chief of the 21st Century Reformation online website, which was created and is maintained by his wife of 45 years, Sharon Gill. The two of them have been blessed with two daughters, two sons-in-law, and seven grandchildren. Pastor Gill is a graduate of the University of Tennessee, and he's done coursework in biblical languages at Vanderbilt Divinity School and Belmont University. He serves as a pastor at Higher Ground Church in White House, Tennessee, which is just north of Nashville. I had a chance to talk with him recently about his new book entitled The One, A Defense of God, which is a sort of overview of what he calls Christian Monotarian Theology. In this interview, we discuss Pastor Gill's religious background, the genesis of this book, and a few of the many topics discussed in it, including Christians and the Older Covenant and the Holy Spirit. Pastor Gill, welcome to the Trinity's Podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm a fan, and uh, it's exciting to actually be a part of it today. This is a little bit unusual. If if you're listening and you hear birds singing and the wind rustling in the trees, it's because we're at the 25th Theological Conference, sponsored by the Restoration Fellowship. We're at the Calvin Center near Atlanta, Georgia, and we're standing in front of a beautiful little lake. It is indeed. Pines. Very, very peaceful, I might say. Beautiful. Uh, Pastor Gill, we're here to talk about your book that you just came out with called The One in Defense of God. And I wanted to start off by asking about your background, because your background is interesting. And it's not something that everybody knows about. So what sort of Christian were you brought up as? Well, I was born into and grew up as a oneness Pentecostal. And while I'm no longer of that persuasion, I do really appreciate my family and uh, people that I was a part of in in that movement and uh, loved uh, all of them and still do. Oneness, as we see it today, is primarily a part of the larger Pentecostal movement overall. Back in the early part of the 20th century, when the Pentecostal movement, as we would think of it today, got going, the Assemblies of God developed. They uh, formed in Arkansas. There were some, though, of those folks who were with the assemblies, uh, or what was to become the assemblies, who actually had difficulties with some of the issues, particularly regarding God and the Trinity. They actually determined that the Trinity just wasn't working. It wasn't making sense to them, uh, scripturally speaking. So uh, those folks, when the the assemblies of God formed, and then some other Trinitarian Pentecostal movements also came along. They didn't go into the Assemblies of God, as it were. They uh, went along and became what now we would call oneness or oneness movement. Those folks eventually formed into some organizations, the largest of which became uh, what is now known as the UPCI, the United Pentecostal Church International. But that was my roots. I I grew up in the uh, United Pentecostal Church and uh, appreciated that very much. Still love all of those folks and uh, appreciate them. They were out, I think, to solve a problem in their minds. And the problem was that the Trinity just wasn't working in their minds. They, they looked and they saw problems with, uh, with the Trinitarian view of God as it had been historically embraced in the church. And Pentecostals aren't really big on reading the ecumenical creeds. No, good, good point. They're Protestants, and they're not the kind of Protestants that recite creeds on Sunday. Right, right. They're, they're not very creedal. They're just looking into the scriptures and particularly into the book of Acts, and all of the Pentecostals were at that time. But as they were looking into the book of Acts and and finding scriptural guidance there for themselves, one of those folks were looking and saying, wow, you know, it seemed to them that the Trinity is not what was being preached and taught in the book of Acts. So 
they set out, I guess, to solve a problem. The problem was that the Trinity wasn't working. It wasn't making sense to them. They solved the problem by saying, well, if God isn't three persons, because that didn't work in their view. They had all been Trinitarians previously, by the way, though, but they went through this reevaluation, I guess you'd say, at that point. But uh, they said if God's not three persons, that was an impossibility in their view. Then Jesus is God, so Jesus must be the only person of God that there is. So particularly back in earlier days, and maybe occasionally might still hear it put this way, but they're referred to as Jesus-only folks. So Jesus is, in that view, the Father. Jesus is the Son, uh, which everyone would kind of get that one. And Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is all of God there is, so that the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in Jesus sometimes would be put to say the, it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all in Jesus. And this one individual reflects all of God that there is. So that's the way I grew up and uh, was taught. And as I say, uh, I still appreciate all of those folks and my own family uh, that I grew up in. My mother and father were from that. And actually, I was third generation oneness, and so was uh, my wife as well. It seems to me there's a, there's kind of a division in how oneness Pentecostals relate to Trinitarians on the one hand, some of them are very belligerent and deny the Trinity and really are very aggressive about that. On the other hand, you see every couple of years some theologians come along or some pastors and they kind of suggest that really it's almost verbal differences between the Trinitarians and the Oneness Pentecostals. Did you experience both of those or were you more the hostile or the accommodating kind? <laughs> well, I guess uh, growing up I saw it all. I think that oneness folks uh, many times were very well studied, still are, knew and understood well what their their particular understanding of the scriptures was. And uh, at least among the folks that I grew up around and with and under, uh, they uh, they were very diligent about the Bible, very uh, and you had some really good good scholarship, if I can say that. I think uh, in error in some important ways now, of course, but but nevertheless, good scholars in that view and uh, able defenders. And I still remember uh, as a young fellow going to debates that were held between uh, oneness pastor and uh, and some other folks of note, uh, Church of Christ folks in particular, and and it was very interesting. I grew up understanding the oneness perspective and the oneness point of view, and it was mine as well. And I think uh, I studied and learned uh, from good teachers in that movement. And uh, I think was, if I may so say, uh, very capable <laughs> in, in understanding my faith and defending the oneness and, uh, and a very uh, firm believer I and all of my family. So you're not oneness now, but you didn't drift away because you were half informed or didn't care or anything like that. You studied your way out of it in a sense, didn't you? I think so. If, if I was not of the view I am today, I might very likely still be a oneness fellow. <laughs> I think uh, there are certainly difficulties with oneness, but I think there's at least that many difficulties with the Trinitarian perspective. So uh, I'm very happy to be where I am today in my understanding and my faith. But I think uh, they were setting out to solve a problem about God couldn't be multiple persons. I just don't think they solved the problem correctly or in the best way. I'm going to put a link on the blog post for this episode to your interesting talk entitled Oneness to One. And you really get into your full story there. It's very interesting. People should check that out. That'll be a link to the 21st Century Reformation website that you run with your wife, Sharon. But just briefly, um, how did you come to your current views, and how would you describe your current views? Well, I was living in Nashville after Sharon and I had gotten married, and uh, we were good oneness folks, if I may so say. Uh, and going to our local oneness church had good oneness pastors and teachers and but I really do believe that it was just the kindness of God that was good toward me and stirred my mind and my heart to realize that while Trinitarianism certainly has, theologically speaking, some very uh, unfortunate 
deficits <laughs> and problems. Uh, I began to realize so, so did our oneness perspective. I didn't really begin to exactly study, but just sitting in my own oneness church, listening to my oneness pastors as they talked and taught, I began to realize there's a disconnect between the way we talked as oneness people and spoke about God and about our faith and about Jesus Christ. There was a disconnect between the way we did that and the way that the Bible actually spoke about those same issues. So we would have uh, testimony services, wonderful services in which people would, would turn in their testimonies, but a testimony service in my oneness church would probably involve a person standing to, to glorify our God, Jesus Christ. And that's also the way a, a, a lesson might begin or a teaching. It certainly would include uh, talking about Jesus Christ, our God. And as I read the scriptures, I began to realize that the scriptures actually spoke about the Father as being God. And Jesus uh, Christ the Messiah, not God, but He as as the Son of God, and He as uh, as the Christ. And in our oneness churches, it was not unusual for the teacher or pastor to to not like some of, some of the language. Uh, if we're talking about Jesus as Christ, that seemed to fall flat. That did not really offer a a good picture of who Jesus is. So. We didn't want to talk about Jesus as Christ. We wanted to talk about Jesus as God. But that sort of belied, if you will, my understanding and, and set me to reading the Scripture more for what they really say. And uh, I remember doing a study one time just um, on a computer and checking out all the Scriptures where the words Jesus and God occur together in the New Testament. And it was just amazing that all of the cases that I looked at, Jesus and God were two different individuals in there. Not two different parts of one individual, but two different individuals. Not two modes of one substance. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, modalism, uh, and many people think of oneness as modalism, uh, actually God operating in different modes or we would hear the term manifestations a lot, that three different, God has three different manifestations. I think there's difficulties there that the three manifestations, after it's all said and done, it's hard sometimes to tell the difference what, between what three manifestations would be and what three persons would be. And yet, in our oneness perspective, we didn't like the idea of three persons at all. We, we had one person having different manifestations, but when you actually begin working with that through the scriptures, it's kind of hard to tell what the difference would have been. Pastor Gill, how did you come up with the idea for this book, The One in Defense of God, and who is your intended reader for this book? Well, I began thinking about this book quite some years ago. Um, my perspective, of course, became over time that the Father is the only true God, and uh, that Jesus is not God, but rather is the Son of God, His human Son, His miraculously begotten human Son, by all means. But as I developed in my understanding of that, at that point, I actually, in my ignorance, I wasn't aware that there were other folks who looked at it that way or saw that. So for some years, I uh, studied and on with my family, and then we had a, a, a group of folks that we studied with and talked with along the, these various lines. But uh, 
Eventually, uh, over time, I began to feel like that perhaps I might could write a book that would be helpful to people in understanding this perspective of God, which I feel like is far better, uh, much clearer than either the Trinitarian or Oneness perspectives. So for some years, I guess, in my mind, I was thinking about how we might could help people to understand this perspective and to realize the what I believe to be the clarity and the power and, if I may say, the beauty of this, and how that it's really much better than modalism or oneness or the various Trinitarian perspectives that you hear. I, I just like this better. It works better for me. It works better for my faith and uh, my faith in God, I think, is much firmer and surer today uh, than it was when I was in that view. Over time, uh, as we, we formed a fellowship and as I taught on these issues and heard others speaking, others speaking on the issues, I did think what I might could write or say that would help others to understand. That's, that was the genesis of the book, I guess. But then I still didn't really write the book to sit down and write it for some years, thought about it and uh, made notes along the way and different things. But but began actually sitting down and putting it all together here a while back. It is a task to write a book, as you know. But on the other hand, I enjoyed writing it and uh, enjoyed thinking about how we might convey a clearer understanding of these things to the folks out there. My audience was not really oneness people exactly, though certainly it would include my oneness friends. But uh, to any Christian, uh, of whatever perspective, I guess Trinitarian, of course, being the, the most popular, but to all the folks who have believed that Jesus is God Almighty or that Jesus is God in addition to the Father, as uh, some of the perspectives would go, I wrote the book trying to kind of build some bridges over to help folks uh, maybe have a better understanding of this this matter, having come from those backgrounds. But I kind of I actually used an approach of writing the, the chapters of the book to maybe the, the person who sits in the pew, who might have an interest in these things. And then I put some of the more technical matters, a lot of the more uh, things that some would find a little more difficult to, to grasp. I have put those into the footnotes, which come at the end of each chapter. So my thought was maybe I could do some work here that would help everybody in some ways to, to, to see these matters better. Well, we've talked about a couple labels already, Pastor Gill. We talked about Trinitarians, Oneness, Pentecostals. And one interesting thing in the book is you coin or almost coin a new term for your kind of view. You have a section here entitled, Why I Am a Christian Monotarian. Mm, mm. So let's talk about that and why not some of the other terms that are out there. Sometimes I think labels are not particularly helpful. They cause us to shortcut maybe having a clearer understanding of, of the issues because we can label something, and I, and I think you commented on this uh, even at this conference, that as long as you can label something, then you can dismiss it very quickly out of hand. But, but on the other hand, I think sometimes uh, it is helpful to have words that express a name uh, for a particular perspective or view, a uh, shorthand for <laughs> addressing that, I guess. And there, there are terms that are used often to address this perspective of the Father as being the only true God. I'm not taking issue with those at all. I think true monotheism, I believe, is a perspective that only the Father is God. I think that's uh, a Jewish perspective. We look at that. There are millions of Jews in the world today who would, I think, agree with that perspective. Even uh, our Muslim friends, uh, folks out there in the Muslim world also, I think, uh, would see that same idea that God is only one, and they would probably identify that with being the Father. So monotheism, but yet folks would claim monotheism where there's, I think, problems still in that view of monotheism. So a Benetarian view is that God is two separate persons, and yet somehow one God, and we'll say we're monotheistic. Or, and uh, on the other hand, uh, 
you can have the, the Trinitarian view that expands that to three persons that we would say are, are God, and uh, yet there's somehow only one God. So we have these, the word monotheism is a great term, and I use it quite often. On the other hand, I think it's sometimes misappropriated from what true, pure monotheism would be. So why not Unitarian or Biblical Unitarian? Well, those are, are nice terms, too. Those would come very near to expressing our perspectives. You might say that anyone who believes that God is one individual is Unitarian. But Unitarian perhaps still doesn't always clarify what kind of Unitarian we are. So we might be a Jewish Unitarian, we might be a, a Muslim Unitarian. But Christian Unitarians, that's to me uh, very much on track then. We're getting there well uh, with that. We would say that now we are Unitarian, 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 as opposed to perhaps Benitarian or Trinitarian. We only have one who is God, and we really mean it. <laughs> but we would say then that Jesus was Unitarian in that sense. He believed that his Father was the only true God, John 17 and 3, and that he then was the Christ, uh, the Son of God, we know that. But one problem with the Unitarian term, and that has been applied and used by a lot of folks over time, and uh, a lot of good folks too. But the problem that arises there, I think, is the Unitarian movement has been uh, awfully uh, fluid and flexible in what it has included, and many times Unitarians have not been very biblical, uh, say that. So that brings us back to uh, the term you meant to, uh, used a moment ago, and biblical Unitarian. And I like that term a lot. I think that expresses very well where we're at. As to the term monetarian, I just offer that to kind of folks out there, and if, if some find it helpful, then, then great. Uh, one of the problems we found with the term Unitarian at any level is that there is the Unitarian Universalist movement, uh, self-described as you use, <laughs> which are folks now who are not particularly Christian. It's a different religion. Right. It, it doesn't relate to what we're doing here at all. The problem being then when you say, well, I'm Unitarian, rather than people seeing that as the faith of Jesus in John 17 and 3 as we do, they see it as being something that's away from Christianity or unbelieving, and, and so there's confusion there. So I think perhaps the term monetarian might be helpful to some, some folks along the way. For As a Christian monetarian, then we're suggesting we're the folks that believe God really is one, just like Jesus did. We believe that the, that the Father is the only true God. Jesus is the Christ, the Christ of God. And the Spirit of God is just God in operation, God operating and working among his creation or in his creation. Just a little terminological side note. There was a day not too long ago when the term Unitarian was a neologism. It was made up in the 1690s by Christians who were Anglicans who didn't believe in the Trinity, but they were sick of being called Socinians because they weren't particularly disciples of Socinus. They were just non-Trinitarian Christians. Mm -hmm. Pastor Gill, there are a lot of people in the world who talk about God. You'll hear about God on the lips of Hindus, New Agers, people who are hard to describe, <laughs> but also Jews, Christians, Muslims, sure. and all the people in the, the last segment that we talked about, Trinitarians, Unitarians, etc. Right. Sure. What, in your view, is the biblical concept of God with capital G? Well, it's interesting. I, I think that humanity at large has tended throughout history to have some notion or concept of a greater being who is above us and to whom we likely owe our existence. At least most folks are agreed with that. To me, I am a biblical person. 
leaving the Trinitarian perspectives behind and leaving my oneness uh, perspective behind, I didn't leave the Bible behind at all. In fact, uh, I would want to be clear that it, it is because of the Bible, it's because of the Scriptures that I'm where I'm at in my faith today and regarding this matter of the one God. My view of the one God today uh, is really the God of the Bible. That I am absolutely taken with. I, I think that no thought or idea or perspective of God matches the God that is spoken of and spoken about and I believe speaks through the scriptures in, in the Bible. That's the God I love, the God of Jesus Christ. I think there's a lot of efforts on the part of people sort of act like Acts 17. They're feeling after him. They're kind of looking for him, reaching after him. And, but I think everything that I have seen in the religions of man falls short of the glory, the power, and the clarity of the one true God of the Bible. And uh, so I'm very much a Bible guy. I'm very much a Jesus fellow. My God is the God of Jesus Christ. Now, I meet people who will say things to me like, uh, yeah, I, I believe in God, but I don't like organized religion. I'm not sure God's personal. Maybe God is a, a divine force. Yeah, they watch Star Wars movies. God, God's the force. <laughs> what, what, what's wrong with that? The notion of a God who is a force in the universe or and so on, and not a person as such, not a personality uh, as I believe God to be, all of that falls short to me. The God of the Bible is a genuine, real being. We are in his image, which begins to give you a little bit of an idea of he's an, in, he's an intelligent being, uh, and he is a, a personal being. He has his own personality, his own character, and uh, he's wonderful and excels us, of course, in every way. Uh, he created us. But I think that God appeals to me, whereas the notions that we find, particularly in the Eastern religions sometimes and, uh, and otherwise, of a God who's sort of a nebulous, just sort of out there, I don't think that's the God of the Bible, and I don't think that idea of God competes well with the understanding of God that we find in the Bible. The God of Jesus, to me, is a personal being. The Father of Jesus Christ is not a nebulous, uh, out there being. We know him and he knows us, or at least certainly we're capable of knowing him. And uh, that would be uh, our objective, I think. So, so I think folks that are in other perspectives, the Eastern religions and New Age, whatever it may be, all of these other things, I would encourage them to maybe stop themselves a little while. Go back actually and read your Bible with fresh eyes. Read the New Testament. Read about Jesus, but read about the God of Jesus and think about that. I think we'll find that understanding of God is wonderful and excels all these other ideas that I believe folks have come up with over time about God. I can't help but notice that you keep calling God he. You're not using he, she, or it, or avoiding pronouns altogether by saying God's self or just always saying God. I mean, what, is this important that you should use personal pronouns? How does this relate to the biblical God versus other ideas of the ultimate? My God is the God of Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. If I'm a Christian, then it would seem to be fundamental that, above all, the God Jesus served, the God that Jesus taught about and spoke of and the God that he communed with, that would be my God. I think that would be a fundamental of being a follower of Christ, that I would be a follower of his God. So I learn of God through Christ, and what I learn is he's a father. He's not a mother. He is a he and not really a she. So I find that it, it just works well and makes sense to me in my faith and in my, my following of Christ that God is a he. Pastor Gill, are you saying that God is literally male, like has a male body? Well, I don't think we would have to necessarily even go there or to that question. I don't in my mind. What I would say is he has revealed himself in the scriptures 
and to his son Jesus in terms that are masculine. And Jesus recognizes him in those kinds of terms. I am a Christian, so it makes sense to me then that I, I follow that route. And it's, it's bright. I think it works very well then as I read the scriptures. And in my own relationship with God, I can look and say, hey, he's, he's my father too. And uh, uh, yes, he is my father. And that's great. So this is a God who speaks and is spoken to. This is a God who makes covenants. Can you talk a little bit about God making covenants? That's actually a big part of the book, and a difference between the deal or the covenant with the Jews and the deal or the covenant that Christians enjoy. Oh, yeah. As I was writing the book and uh, kind of reading back through the scriptures, and I was just fascinated with the fact that God made arrangements, if you will, or deals, as you say, I, I like that term, with human beings. And to me, that shows a God who is involved. He's not that being that's off somewhere and we don't really know him. And he, he wants to know us as his creation, and he wants to be involved with us. And I think we see that over and over again. I, I particularly was just fascinated to read again the story of Abraham and of uh, the early fathers there and their relationship to God, the connections they had with him. Uh, beautiful, beautiful things. And he did make deals with them. Uh, he made a deal with Abraham. Abraham was going to be blessed in so many ways. And Abraham's side of the deal was he would serve God and he would not serve others, but he would he would walk with God and, and do those things that God asked him to do, directed him to do. So that was wonderful. It's interesting to me. I think there's a lot of confusion on the part of Christians today regarding the later deal, <laughs> one that came through Moses. And uh, this was a, uh, a wonderful thing as well, a beautiful uh, covenant, if you will, arrangement that God made. But he did make that arrangement with the children of Israel, if you will, that came out of Egypt. Moses said, uh, you know, this, this deal is with y'all, <laughs> you today. It wasn't with your fathers. It was with all of us here today and with our descendants. So it was a wonderful thing, the, the law of Moses, as we would say, or that great covenant through Moses. But it was only with a very limited, small portion of the human population of, of humanity that that covenant was made. The covenant was made not to last forever. In fact, it wasn't, uh, I mentioned in the presentation uh, here the, the other night, the law was not eternal. Abraham was not under the law of Moses. Moses wasn't even born when Abraham came along. And the, the great promises that were made to Abraham were not contingent on the law of Moses. The law came in later, several hundred years later, after Abraham. And it was a great arrangement between God and a few people, certain few, wonderful people, important people, but the Jewish nation that came out of, uh, out of Egypt. And so the law was formed. It was wonderful. It led and was intended to lead the Jewish people to the Messiah, to Christ. And that brings us to the new covenant that uh, when Christ would come, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us then, we would no longer be under that earlier arrangement. It was to get us to Christ. Now that Christ and faith in Christ has come, we now have this new arrangement. And the arrangement wasn't something that Jesus just dreamed up, so to speak. Uh, according to Jeremiah, uh, and I talk about this in the book, God from early on had in mind another arrangement he would make, not just with Jewish folks, but with all of humanity. And that's where Jesus comes on the scene. And now we know that God, who spoke in time past, the writer of Hebrews says he's, he spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets in various ways. But he said that uh, now, in this time, he has spoken to us by a son. Actually, his son, the son, Jesus Christ. You did talk about this in your presentation at this conference. It's a very nice talk. It's addressed to people who get into the so-called Jewish roots movement. Yeah. That is something that is also addressed in the book at, at a little bit of length. You put it in a proper context 
it seems that a lot of people, when they become biblical Unitarians, they get the idea, well, okay, you need to interpret things in Hebrew categories. Mm. You need to undo some, some bad influence of Platonism and so on. Sure. And it puts them on a trajectory where the next thing you know, they're trying to eat kosher, keep Jewish holidays, and sometimes it's dabbling and sometimes it's much more serious. Mm. Have you had experience with this among like-minded people? Yeah, I sure have. And uh, that I think that is a problem that occurs sometimes. Uh, you have folks that are coming to an understanding, and there are really more and more folks that are coming to this understanding that God is only one, only one individual, and that that one is the Father. And uh, But as they're doing that, they're, they're saying, well, hey, then the Jews had that idea right. So maybe, maybe the Jews are right about we ought to keep the law of Moses, but I would encourage everyone to take time and, and to work their way through that carefully because that is not the way that we would want to receive and to know Christ. And the God of Jesus Christ has given to us a new arrangement, a new covenant in him. And as you note in the presentation there, some people punt on Paul. Oh, yeah. But it's not just Paul by any means. It's, it's the whole New Testament, really, in the wider context of the Bible. Exactly. It seems to me there could be a thin line between just doing Jewish things as a hobby, uh, but then there's always that one zealous person who starts to think that you're a little more spiritual if you do these things, if you sure. keep the holidays or keep the Sabbath right. and so on. Right. Is that your experience? Yeah, uh, I was going to say I've run into... Jewish roots folks and rabbis and so on and, and very devout people, very dedicated people. So uh, that's to me not in question at all. I think they are misguided to think that somehow they are right or more righteous or better off <laughs> as Christians by keeping things that pertain to the law that God gave to the those Jews who came out of Egypt. It becomes a problem. Uh, it becomes difficult if you begin keeping those days and those various requirements. Then it becomes very difficult for folks to even worship together after a while because if, if some are not trying to keep that particular Jewish perspective of things, then it becomes difficult for them to worship with the folks who are determined to do that. So I would encourage every Christian, and I find a lot of confusion on this matter, even among folks who are not necessarily Jewish roots, as we would say, or even just among mainstream Christians, there's a lot of confusion about, well, aren't we still under the law or parts of the law, or shouldn't we be doing some of those things or all of those things, or, and how does this work? So um, actually, the, the fourth chapter of the, of the book, I devoted to trying to bring some clarity on those issues for Christians and for folks to get a, a maybe a clearer, better picture, a better understanding of how all that how all that should work for the Christian today. And then surely we're not under the law of Moses. Gentiles never were. <laughs> it's it's almost uh, if it wasn't so serious, it would be uh, almost humorous to think of Gentiles today trying to keep the law of Moses. It wasn't our covenant. We were never under it to begin with. And uh, so we're kind of kind of getting out of our place, I think, by going and trying to keep someone else's covenant that wasn't ours. We were not a part of that and, and still are not. In Christ, Christ actually is, I think, everything now to those who will be in Christ. He is, as uh, I mentioned in Colossians 2 and 10, we're complete in him. We're made absolutely complete in Christ. That's without Moses, without the law, without these other things. Christ now is our law. He is our Torah. He gives us the Torah, Galatians 6 and 2. Uh, keep the Torah of Christ. So I would encourage Christians today, all Christians, no matter what their background, think about that. Learn to realize that Jesus is He's everything now in this new program of God that extends not only to those limited people who came out of Egypt and their descendants, but now to all humanity. It's wonderful. And so anyway, the, the fourth chapter of the book is written to encourage folks along that line. Thank you.
Pastor Gill, you began your Christian life, and you and your wife and your family, your extended families, lived for a long time in the orbit of Pentecostal Christianity. Right. And uh, I might think there's, in a sense, you still are a Pentecostal in that you're, you're not a bitter ex-Pentecostal that rejects it's all nonsense and whatnot. Oh, there, no. There's yeah. still an aspect to your spiritual life, I'm guessing, that is sort of Pentecostal in its type. And I think people would think me remiss if I didn't ask you for your views on the Holy Spirit. What is your view of the Holy Spirit, and do you agree that there's something about Christian experience that supports the idea of the Holy Spirit as a person in addition to the Father and the Son? Well, you're right about our background, and uh, right in that neither have I nor my wife abandoned or turned, uh, you know, against, if you will, our Pentecostal roots. Uh, we we have not done that, and, and I don't foresee that happening, partly because of experience, but even more so, I think, because of the Scriptures and our understanding view of the Scriptures. With regard to the Scriptures and the Spirit, I address the question of, is the Spirit the Holy Spirit, a, a separate entity, a separate person of God, separate from the Father, separate from Jesus. And that's really the sixth chapter of the book. So that entire chapter is devoted to taking a fresh look at the question of is really is the Holy Spirit a separate entity, a separate person. The conclusion that the reader will find in the sixth chapter is it's really not a separate person. It's not a separate individual from the Father. It is the Father in action. It's Him in motion. It is Him. It is God, but the God that it is is the Father in work, in motion, in action. So the sixth chapter is devoted to that. I would encourage, again, Christians give a fresh look at this question of the Holy Spirit. The arguments usually made to see the Holy Spirit as a separate entity actually, I think, are on the very thinnest of grounds. It doesn't really work very well. Get the book, read that sixth chapter, and then let me know what you think about that, because I think the case for the Holy Spirit actually being the Father in action is a far better case than the idea that the Holy Spirit as a person or entity separate from the Father. So as far as uh, our Christian experience in the Spirit, I think all Christians, at least certainly, I think most all the Christians that I know of all stripes, do believe in the activity of the Spirit in the life of the Christian. There's some connection, some relationship there, and I think that for Christians that's important. So I think the uh, there is this question about Pentecostal experience, uh, which is another question, but maybe it needs to wait for uh, the next book. <laughs> maybe we'll have a chapter in the next book to, to talk about that some. But I would uh, encourage people, wherever you're at in relationship to your walk with God, in your experience with the Spirit of God, be open-minded and look to God because there may be more depth, more involvement by His Spirit that we can experience as Christians, again, no matter what our background may be. And I think that's important, and uh, it's certainly important to us. Pastor Gill, thanks for talking with us. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. I, I love your blog, and uh, we'll continue to follow you and uh, look forward to seeing you again in, in the future. <laughs> Again, Pastor Gill's book is called The One, In Defense of God. It's available on Amazon, and we have a link for it on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. Also, be sure to check out his website at 21stcr.org. That's the 21st Century Reformation online website. This week's thinking music has been the track Pieces of Life by CDK. Before you go, I just wanted to say thanks to Jan in the Slovak Republic for his donation through PayPal. If you'd like to donate to the Trinity's podcast, just look for the orange buttons to the right of any blog post. for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.com.
www.thepeacefulmovement.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind. <laughs>